morning uh, or mm-hmm. afternoon today is today is Sunday July 24th um, let's uh, set our intention make aspirations by saying the four immeasurable four immeasurables prayer May all beings of happiness and the causes of happiness, may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering, may all beings not be separated from happiness that is never known suffering, may they rest equanimity, free from attachment, anger, and aversion. Um, so we, we uh, will meditate, and, and um, Victoria is going to talk a bit about shamatha, and vipassana, two forms of meditation that that uh, that we do. Um, I wanted to read something to you. This is from a really great teacher who passed away not that long ago. His name was Namkai Norbu Rinpoche. Um, N a m k a i n o r b u. And uh, you should look him up, get his books, get his teachings. <coughs> um, he was he was truly amazing, one of the great masters of you know of our times. Um, he says there is a saying that some Mahasiddhas, Mahasiddha is a great like great teacher, great lama, great practitioner. Some Mahasiddhas, Tilopa and others, when giving advice to the students, said. Vision is not the problem. That means it it is not necessary to always have pure vision. If you have bad vision, vision is not the problem. The problem is attachment. So pure vision is, you know, um, when a realized master or a practitioner has, can see everything, all beings and everything as a manifestation of Buddha mind, Buddha nature, the Dharmakaya, you know. Bad vision is worldly vision. You know, we see it as dual, you know, self and other, things like that. If you have bad vision, vision is not the problem. The problem is attachment. Attachment is not outside. Can you understand that? So how can that get in the state of self-liberation? For example, if I'm a practitioner and I am here and I open my eyes, when I open my eyes, I can see something. In the same way, I can also hear something with my ears. I can smell with my nose. All my senses are open. That means I have contact with objects. Objects of senses. That is part of vision. So that is not a problem if I am in instant presence. Any kind of vision, whatever I see, good or bad, doesn't change anything. The problem is, in general, that we immediately lose presence We follow the vision. When we see something very nice, we think, oh, how nice that is. I like it. What does it mean, I like it? It means I want it also. I want to try to get that. If I can't get that, there are problems. And I feel angry. Then other emotions arise. Attachment plus others. So that is called, in the Buddhist teaching in general, chag dang. Chag and dang. Chag means attachment. Dang means anger. We don't like it and we refute it. If we are attached, we accept. We accept, reject, accept, reject, even when it's not necessary. We pass our lives this way. That means we are always distracted with this. That is a problem. For that reason, when we follow the teachings, we say, try to be aware, not always distracted. That is not good. With our two legs of attachment and and anger, we accept and reject. Now I accept, now I reject. Then we walk this way and that in samsara. It never finishes. Then we add many actions and accumulate many (coughs) negativities. When we say self-liberate, we should self-liberate that. Be in instant presence. You don't need any antidote or some particular method to liberate that. Just by being in that state, everything liberates. So this is called self-liberation. 
when he talks about presence, which is really awareness, mindfulness, you know. Um, you know, what we're <coughs> doing here, these t- it, 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 it's, it's very difficult, you know. Uh, we're asking of ourselves to work towards being mindful of everything we think and do and say. Which is very different than how we've operated through a lot of our lives. I think we've we've always maintained a certain level of confidence that we're good people, we're educated people, we believe in the right things. So how we're going to react and respond, what we want, what we don't want, are right for the most part. And the, this practice is kind of really tearing all that down and rebuilding it because the habitual way was without presence and without awareness. It really was about attachment and rejection. Confidence in what we're rejecting because we know it to be bad. Confidence in what we're attached to, uh, attached to and desiring because we think it worthy or good. And now we're asking ourselves to really have an awareness before we give in to the attachment and the rejection to let go of the impulse and knee-jerk reaction to whatever we're perceiving, the sense perception, and just have an openness and spaciousness. Why are we attracted to that? Why do we want that? Why do we reject that? Why do we hate that? Why are we separating self and other? Why are we going beyond just the presence of the moment and, and uh, acceptance of the moment. And that's a lot of work. So we have to be patient. You know, we have to really, really be patient with ourselves. And it's only going to happen by bit by bit, step by step, through doing this more and more. You know, really in life, in the midst of, not just on the cushion. I mean, it's hard, It's much harder to do off the cushion. In life, wherever you are, in circumstances, going into this state of mindfulness, whatever you use, visualizations of the cloud or breath or just mind looking at mind and starting to habituate that as, as a foundation of where we're coming from as people, really. It's, it's tall order, so be patient. You know, um, and don't look at, I'm not even going to talk about enlightenment, but don't look at, we can't approach this path with, you know, as a result-oriented thing, you know, desiring enlightenment, this as the goal, of the, as Chogim Trippa Rinpoche says, the path is the goal, the goal is the path. We don't want to also look at it with this poverty mentality, some people call it, like, I'll never do this. I'm hopeless as a practitioner. I'm the worst practitioner. Uh, maybe in future lives I'll get it, or maybe when I'm 90 before I die I'll get it. It's not about getting it. It just adds another thing to, you know, desire and be attached to and reject and things like that. You know, have confidence in in the path, you know, because many, 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 many people have tread this path, you know. For 2,500 years, some of the greatest, you know, beings that have been on this planet among us have. Um, this is not, you know, something we're in, inventing by any means, of course. And it's not a modern in, invention or system. It's very old and been proven to, uh, to work, I guess. So, you know, don't... Um, you know, be grateful for the, the small victories, you know what I mean? Be grateful for one day when something, you know, you're in the midst of a situation and you have a bit of mindfulness before you react, something that really pushes a button, whether it's to desire it or to reject it or to be angry about it or to be lustful for it, whatever it is, you know. And that moment you're able to step into that mindfulness and let things go and breathe through it, you know. Um, have confidence in that when that happens, that that's real, that that is the path. With the, um, let's, let's meditate.
with that, you know, with that in mind. Um, we'll start with the nine purifying breaths and then go into uh, some meditation. final breath we imagine it going through the, the middle channel the blue channel out through the crown chakra merging our consciousness with space into meditation <clears throat>
if your mind feels uh, particularly agitated, distracted today, try lowering the angle of your gaze and vice versa. If you feel a little sluggish, a um, little like zoned out, spaced out, try raising the angle of your gaze. Slightly, not a lot, either way. Yeah, usually I do a little talk, guiding and stuff, but I think sometimes it's good not to hit me blabbing throughout the practice. Uh, so, 
Most of you have done this a lot, I've been here a lot, so I'm sure it was fine. Uh, Victoria's going to take over from here for a bit, and we'll do some questions. Um, uh, when you're ready, use the Q&A function, and uh, after Victoria uh, uh, speaks, then we'll, we'll um, go into the <coughs> questions. Thanks. So, in this group, in this context, we're always discussing the mind, because as Buddhist practitioners, we are concerned with the mind. The mind is the source of all the exterior things, in order to understand those byproducts, we have to understand the mind, know the mind. Uh, and this is a quote uh, from a book, Luminous Clarity, by Kenshin Trangor Rinpoche, who is the principal teacher, tutor of His Holiness the Karmapa. Uh, Our mind is the source of all experience and therefore of all our suffering. If we realize the nature of mind, we overcome all suffering. <clears throat> so the question, of course, comes about what is suffering? And I think in the most simple Occam Razor's, you know, a formula, suffering is twofold. Or it's onefold, but comes down to something like this. Suffering is... I like this, I don't like this. And the other cause of suffering, the really more ground cause of suffering is self-cherishing. Self-cherishing the attachment to the I, which produces I like this, I don't like this, uh, is the cause, is the ground of suffering. To understand and to identify, uh, to impute this made up I, I am, this is mine. To understand this and to understand the pile of ignorant concepts upon which this construct rests is really to be aware and also, if you take that into a formal practice, is to meditate. When we cut through this source of the I, mine, and I like this and I like that, is really to understand the nature of things, how they arise, and is also to meditate, is to cut through that layer. When we fixate on this and we just allow this to go unconsciously, this I, this pile of, this construct of concepts, uh, that we change or re renew every so often, but we re reinforce every single day because this kind of identity has to be reinforced every day. But really their identity is just like a game profile. You know, when we play a video game, we create a profile for ourselves. In life, we do the same thing, but we reinforce it so much and we don't examine it any longer. So we have this false sense of there is that identity. It is real. I am real, you know, this profile I created for myself is beyond any doubt. But really when we meditate and we examine, we analyze, that identity, it's just the same like any game profile, it's just much more solidified and the difference between the game profile and <coughs> the sense of I is the much more fixated and thicker, what in Buddhism we call coarse conceptual structure, you know, whereas in the gaming profile we know we've created this profile and, you know, we're using this for the moment uh, uh, or for the duration of time we're playing the game. In life we're doing the same thing, it's really not that much different. We just have a different attitude toward that. There's something sacred and something where we it goes beyond any doubt and question what this I is. 
but if you really look at it, it's, which is what we do as practitioners. So the difference is ordinary person does not examine it. We just go on with that belief. We have this absolute faith in the eye, whereas a practitioner examines it and <clears throat> understands the components. That's why we've been studying the eight, uh, uh, the eight minds. Uh, to understand the structure of how these things arise, how they're created, and how they're maintained uh, in order to be able to break through and penetrate. Uh, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to liberate these fixations? For two reasons. In pragmatic sense, we want to eliminate suffering because the thicker the fixation, and the less understanding of this fixation and the cause of this fixation, the greater is the suffering. Uh, that self-cherishing the component of the eight uh, minds, that is the seventh component, which is called the afflicted mind, uh, the thing that we identify with as the self, uh, is the cause of suffering. It's not really our perceptual mind and the mental consciousness that says, this flower is red, it's very bright, it's this and this. Yes, those, you know, the five sensory consciousnesses and the six uh, mental consciousness keeps us very, very busy, occupied, always turned outward. It's where all the information is perceived and then it's classified. And it's like a child being always occupied with a game. We can be very, very busy with it, but it's not where we get into trouble. We get into trouble is where we take that sensory information and the mental categorizing information, and then we start to say, I hate that red flower. I can't stand that, you know, that particular person. Or I love that person. I love that flower. I cannot live without it. We're looking at fixations in its twofold nature. You know, we, we're very used to judging things as good and bad. The things we like, we call them good. The things we don't like, we call them bad. In Buddhism, they're an identical thing, just that we have an attitude of great desire and attachment to one, and we have uh, hatred, and we want to avoid the other. Both are very much the same. They're just fixations and labeling of uh, that comes from the source of consciousness number seven. And from the same book, uh, Luminous Clarity, uh, this is how Kenshin Rinpoche speaks about uh, the seventh consciousness. The seventh consciousness is called the afflicted consciousness, and it is constantly present. And it is the very subtle fixation on the self and the fixation of the duality, I and the other. It does not constantly have the thought of, I am here, but rather it has the most subtle level of constantly being aware of the I. This constant duality of I and other leads to the disturbing emotions. In Sanskrit, they're called kleshas. Uh, and therefore, it is also called the seventh klesha or afflicted consciousness. It is this seventh consciousness, the afflicted consciousness, that divides the world into two and sets up this tension. But within that divisiveness of duality, we have these two attitudes. We are very attached to one thing, and we're very uh, hateful of another thing. In other words, we have aversion and attachment. So the seventh consciousness perceives the world almost always in within one of these polarities. Sometimes it has a more neutral zone, but in a way that's also a judgment that says, this is uh, not dangerous or not interesting to me, but most of the time we deal with these two attachment and aversion consciousnesses. This is the suffering. This is the cause and the nature of suffering. The nature of, of this particular suffering is that we don't know what this is. We think that the suffering is created out there. In the meantime, suffering is how we perceive sensory information, 
how we judge things. Suffering is calling this, I, I want this and I'm grasping at it, or I hate this and I have an aversion to it. The stronger the fixation of either kind of, of this desire or aversion is the stronger is the suffering and of course we know that there are three doors through which everything happens our body speech and mind so an example of the uh this grasping and attachment on the the level of body is when we're attached to alcohol or food or uh you know substances or any kind of physical behaviors we bite our nails we we, we, we scratch the wound any of these kinds of things. The thing is to pay attention to is the fixation. We fixate on that. We go back to it over and over and over again. This is the thickening. And we, of course, as ordinary beings, we don't say, I am going back to it. This is my fixation. I've created this fixation by uh, judging it or categorizing it internally in this way. What we say is, this is out there, I am here, this is here, and my relationship to this thing is somehow caused by that thing and forces me to act this way, such as, for example, when I see someone and I'm no longer seeing them as a person, but I call them an enemy, and each time I'm going to see that person, even without perceiving them, I am just reacting to my label. Remember, when we label things, we no longer see them. So every time I see that guy, I don't see the guy, I see the enemy. I'm just reacting to my label. And that's where the suffering comes in, is we reacting to our own fixations. The fixation of speech is when we constantly say negative things. Uh, I am bad. He is bad. I'm not worth it. He is a horrible, worthless being. And we continue this dialogue all the time. We go back and go back to it without examining and understanding. The source is the judgment, the fixation. And then, of course, you know, the mental fixation is when we think and we judge before we even experience. So immediately, the minute I perceive that person, the thought comes up inside me, uh, this is my enemy. or you know, we, we for a moment we think of our mother, we say she didn't give me this, she didn't do this for me, and that is all that we can associate with the mother. We, we, we forget to even think of all the other aspects of love and the fact that we weren't abandoned, we were fed, we were clothed, we were raised. We fixate, we choose to fixate on that aspect where we have this dissatisfaction. And uh, pretty much most often we fixate on a negative aspect of someone else is so that we can use that as a shield in one hand so and we call this kind of like the shield of righteousness and right behind that shield comes a hand with the club that clubs uh, and hurts the other person it is a convenience, it is a tactic and, and a mechanism of convenience to call something bad so that right in the next instance we can behave in very horrendous ways toward those things. Such as, for example, I mean, the obvious examples that come to mind are uh, animal activists who eat meat or. Uh, I'm not going to get into a whole slew of examples. Examples are everywhere all the time. We engage in all those kinds of activities. So we're here to really pick and try to penetrate through our own negativities uh, so that we can cut our own suffering and so that we can also cut on making others suffer based on our judgments and based on our fixation of the I and the other. This whole construct, the eight consciousnesses, is called the secondary mind. It is secondary because it is something that requires a different basis. It is something that is, uh, can only happen on the basis of the first mind. And the first mind is something, something very, very simple. And that's just our nature of mind. It is our 
capacity to see, perceive, and perceive. It is the cognizant nature of mind, and it is the spacious nature of mind in which before things exist and before things are perceived and labeled and then acted upon with this fixation of our own imputed label, we need that fresh pre-conceptual consciousness, which is that first consciousness that we call the nature of mind. It is this first mind, this fresh, open, cognizant, luminous consciousness that we try to learn about in meditation. We try to cut through the fog of the second, eighth consciousness's mind, the conceptual judging mind. We try to cut through in meditation through the clouds in order to see the sky, sky-like mind our nature of mind. And when we look at that mind, if we can stabilize and through shamatha, the two techniques we were discussing for the last two weeks, shamatha vipassana, we can soften and we can quiet the events, the arisings, the appearances of the mind, what the eight consciousnesses this secondary mind does, the conceptual mind does. If we can, can quiet down all the mental events and we can see the ground. Uh, Michael and I used to go to the teachings. Uh, many, many teachings, teachers will use this metaphor of uh, if you have uh, a pond and you take a stick and you stir the, 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 the base, uh, the water becomes very, very unclear, so you cannot see the ground. You have to wait until the water settles, and then you can see both water and the ground very, very clearly. The same metaphor is used with clouds in the sky, how the mind observes itself. It namely does it in two ways. We observe the mind in stillness and in motion. When the sut and the clouds are around so that we can see that the same nature needs to ground the activity of the mind, the occurrences of the mind, as the same, that same nature that we see in the mind's stillness when we are meditating and we're employing the technique of shamatha. Shamatha is when the mind, when all the sat and all the thoughts and all the events can become still. We use vipassana so that when we do have this clinging and perpetual sense of self or we say thoughts are real, if at any time we imply some kind of reality and impute reality we use the vipassana analytical meditation to say what is mind what is thought who is thinking what is this hate and it's like seeing the hand grasping at uh, smoke the mind turns to itself and sees its empty nature and that's how we lessen the events of the mind being insane and running after them and that's how we also understand the nature of all those afflicted emotions that arise when we ask who is thinking, where is this anger, what is this jealousy, we see it like smoke and we return back, we're able to penetrate through the thickness of the cloud back into the sky-like nature. And I would like to read a quote from Guru Rinpoche that's very, very important because I think often we are very apprehensive uh, when the word emptiness is used in regard to our mind. And so we have to understand that it's in a very specific way. In the state of shamatha meditation, look directly, and this is a quote, it's a partial quote from Guru Rinpoche, Guru Padmasambhava, an Indian master, Mahasiddha, who went to Tibet in the 8th century and brought uh, Buddhism to Tibet. Uh, 
uh, in the state of shamatha meditation, look directly at the nature of that which is at rest. When you do so, you will observe that it has no substantial entity or characteristics of shapes and color. It has no substantial existence whatsoever. From this you may ask, isn't this utter emptiness and utter absence of substantial entity that is nothing whatsoever? Is this what is, uh, that is what is called the empty nature of mind. But if you look further in, at that emptiness that you experience the mind to be, don't you see that while it is utterly empty, it has an unceasing and unlimited lucidity or knowingness as a correct characteristic also. And that characteristic of luminous clarity, something that is clear without any obscuration, lucidity that is completely open and spacious, and open and spacious is what we refer to as the empty aspect, unimpeded, unstoppable aspect. Uh, open and spacious rather than simply blank. It is what is called the luminous clarity characteristic of the mind. It seems that there are, there are two distinct aspects to the mind. If, if you keep on looking at the mind, which is what we do in shamatha, in meditation, if you keep on looking at the mind, you will begin to realize that the absence of any kind of substantial entity and the unceasing radiance of that emptiness are not really two different things. They are the same thing, and, they are, and their sam sameness is the very receptive, glaring awareness. Receptive, glaring, or lit up awareness, which is which its receptivity being empty and its quality of being lucid. Other than the fact that the mind is aware and that you can experience this awareness, there is nothing else you can say about it. And this is what we observe. We use the faculty of ob observation. Mind turned onto itself, mind observing mind outside of this empty spacious what we call uh, outside of this open spacious the quality we call empty we also realize the lucid the aware the capable of uh, recognizing this unity is what we experience as awareness and that's all we're doing in meditation we are watching our the nature of our mind. We're watching our true natures, uh, the qualities of our mind. Shamatha is, when we can attain a, 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 an adequate enough level of shamatha, this nature, these, these qualities, the empty lucidity, or emptiness and lucidity. This cognizant quality of the mind will become revealed. It's not something that we can go and get. So as Michael was saying before from the quote of Namka and Norbu, we cannot project these qualities and strive for them because all we're gonna get as a result of that striving is another conceptual formation. What, what needs to happen in meditation is that everything has to settle. The clouds have to disperse. And then we can see the ground. Everything has to settle on the ground uh, of the pond. And then we can see the ground. If something arises, we use Vipassana. We use analysis and we say, what is this thought? Who is thinking of this thought? And then you again re-experience this empty, luminous, cognizant quality, mind looking at mind. 
You do the same thing also in ordinary situations when, for example, anger arises, when you cannot just say that is a man, that uh, an experience of person, but you're experiencing an enemy. You turn to yourself. You, as a practitioner, you're aware enemy is nothing that's out there. It's it's the way that you perceive something or someone, and you understand underneath it the quality of anger, and you're asking at that very moment too. You're not letting the horse run out and create karma and suffering. You're asking yourself. You're. Where is the anger? What is the anger? Does it have color? Does it have shape? Who is thinking this anger? Where is the self that is connected to that anger? And so you dissolve that. And f at, if you are able to liberate at that moment through, through awareness and bringing about this knowledge that you get in meditation, you can liberate the afflictive emotion and then you can perceive the situation and act from a different source. Believe me, that act activity will be much more profound because it will come from clarity and compassion. And you won't have your usual, normal, uh, afflictive behavior. And you won't create karma, but you'll be able to see very, very clearly within that open space of mind. And your activity will produce very different results. Gautam Rinpoche always says, it's not how something looks externally, the appearance, because under the shield of righteousness, we can hide tremendously horrible feelings and com com uh, stay unaware of them. But if we can bring awareness into our daily life, or what is called in Buddhism, post-meditation, if we can examine and act out of awareness and with awareness, our activity will be incredible, you know, we'll have a, Coming from a different source, if the activity, Gautam Rinpoche says, if the activity comes from compassion, the results are going to be that. If activity comes from affliction, do not expect it to be anything as a result but an affliction. Even if it's guising itself under some very righteous and correct and this and this kind of motivation, if it's only the guise but not the real cause, if it's not coming from awareness and spaciousness and ability to suspend judgment but simply to see and to experience, you, we cannot hope to have any other results other than afflictions and that is what the suffering is, that is the cause of suffering. So if we want to know what the cause of suffering is, if we want to understand our suffering that we're experiencing now, we have to look at our mind. If we find our mind to be in one state, the results will be things of that state. If we wish, if we wish to have a life without suffering and the life of compassion and awareness, we have to make sure that we start from that place. As in Bodhis 37 Bodhisattva practices, the very last stanza says, whatever I'm engaged in, that means meditation and post-meditation, meditation and ordinary activity. We should always ask ourselves, what is the state of my mind? So again, to repeat and to reiterate, shamatha, vipassana are the two methods by which we cut through the second conceptual mind the eight consciousnesses is another word for this second conceptual mind. Uh, why do we cut through it? So that we can understand and control the source of our activity and so that we can understand where all these things come from. What is the source of suffering or what is the source of compassionate action and compassionate life? And we watch our mind in movement as we engage in activity as well as in meditation. We simply observe. We suspend our judgment. And as Kandra Rinpoche says, you know, if the world is without your judgment for 15 minutes, nothing horrendous will happen. The planet will still be back here after our meditation session. <laughs> and what we get in meditation session, we try to take it with us into the post-meditation se session. And I'm going to have Michael read 
the post meditation, the practice of post meditation. This in addition. In addition to the practice of meditation is the practice of post meditation. Meditation is not enough because no matter who we are, we still have things to do. We're going to be spending a lot of time doing them off the cushion, even if we're diligent. In meditation, if we don't do anything about the state of mind, in post-meditation, we're not going to progress. Because if we're diligent in meditation, but let our mind wander the whole time in post-meditation, then our post-meditation will, will undo whatever is achieved in our, post, in our meditation. Post-meditation is life off the cushion, life, basically. I just wanted to add, I'm so sorry, that shamatha aspect deals with what is called proliferation. Proliferation, that particular portion of meditation that we call shamatha or karma binding deals with the proliferation of the second mind, uh, mental activity, lots and lots of mental activity. And the more, the less we understand where the mental activity arises from and the source of it, the thicker it is and the more likely we are to believe that things out there have real effects on us. And uh, Vipassana deals with what is called, the Vipassana aspect of meditation deals with what is called co-emergent ignorance. What is co-emergent ignorance? Is this belief in the self. In other words, with whatever we experience, we also feel like it's uh, to the audience of one, me, myself, that the whole world is there kind of for me, uh, uh, in my view, in my, uh, on my stage, within my space, and I am there to judge it. That's co-emergent ignorance. So the sooner we get through and cut through the delusion of the self, when we understand experiences arise within this vast spacious and luminous awareness, the sooner we can cut through a lot of suffering in our life and we can cut through uh, uh, dealing this suffering onto others because it is in our ignorance that we experience and cause suffering. And that's why we meditate, to cut through these uh, through the eight consciousnesses, through that busy mind uh, that is extremely unaware, that causes tremendous suffering to us and creates a lot of suffering for others. So we meditate to liberate that X. Thank you very much. I'm going to take some questions. I was wondering what you said about being distracted versus aware. I would like to be more mindful and aware, but I find distracting myself with daydreams or TV to keep me content when I'm alone. When I'm alone, I find it very easy to spiral into my own thoughts. Just wonder if you had any advice on this, how to overcome distraction. When distraction feels like a reprieve from suffering. I mean, that's basically the, the whole thing in a nutshell is why we're here you know and why we're practicing because that is our default mechanism um is you know distraction um uh when, especially when it like as you say feels like a reprieve from suffering i think you're specifically addressing when you're um being alone I think it's a matter of just practice, you know, um, both on the cushion and then in life and bringing your mindfulness to that. Um, there's also, there's nothing wrong with, you know, daydreaming and watching TV, you know. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, it's when those things will really, t you know, if you want to watch TV to relax or, you know, sometimes daydreaming is good to think about you know if there's maybe there's something you want to do or you're working on a project or there's a you know a goal you want to meet um we're practicing meditation and we're working with our thoughts and letting them dissipate and trying to be in a state of you know equanimity but it's not like we're saying uh thinking is wrong it's not saying like tv is bad for you necessarily it's attachment to these things when the attachment inflames us, you know, kind of closes us 
freezes us, locks our mind into a place where if you don't get what you want, you become angry or you become really sad, you know. When those things take hold, that's when you need to, you know, apply the practice, when you need to look into why, you know, these emotions are arising, things like that. I think that's where you have to start to differentiate, you know. Um, I don't think you need to be really hard on yourself and judgmental saying, uh-oh, I'm watching TV again, I shouldn't be doing that, I should be meditating. That's not necessarily what we're saying. Do you want to add to that? I mean, it seems to me that uh, what you're expressing is that you feel that you run from suffering into another form of uh, waste of time. And it's so, by doing so excessively perhaps, can become another form of suffering. All in all, I think for all of us to think about that when we're experiencing suffering, besides taking a bath, having a glass of wine, doing certain ordinary things, we still have to, after that is done, we still have to address and understand the causes of suffering so that we may alleviate them and hopefully liberate them completely. So no matter what we do for a moment of reprieve, which is we need to do that because we also live in a world where we are bombarded by negativity day and night and our mind can only has a capacity to perceive only so much of it but no matter how often and how the strength of the onslaught of all these kinds of things we have to still understand what is suffering and the causes of suffering and so that's where meditation and mindfulness comes in. What we learn on the cushion, we only learn so we can apply it to life. If the moments of reprieve are within the norms or within the time spans that you don't feel that are hurting you or you're just running into them incessantly and now you're creating another kind of a suffering where you feel you're losing time unnecessarily or it becomes another habitual fixation, outside of the moments of reprieve obviously it's very important to address what is suffering and the causes of suffering and there's no other way of doing it other than uh, one finding the nature of mind and therefore relaxing the notion of the ego because it is from our ego and our judgment that I hate this I want this and I'm not getting it uh, where that comes from it is in that judgment in relationship to this notion of the self where pain arises. I didn't get that job. He didn't smile at me the right way. She didn't call me back. He didn't give this to me. I got too little. I, I you know, all that is suffering. That really truly is suffering. So sooner or later we have to address those kinds of things. And sooner or later we have to find repose not in uh, distractions but in the in shamatha, in Vipassana, in a true nature of mind because that is the only place where we are not driven by pain and suffering but where we have clarity and we have uh, we have the openness within which it's the only time that we can say we're really there where we're supposed to be it's the only place and the only time that we can say that we are home at least that is my personal experience. Uh, friends who practice uh, have expressed the same thing to me. It's the only place we're not running anywhere to and running anywhere from. So I would just say meditate more. And if escaping the difficulties becomes the escape, the momentum of escape becomes something that has become a burden because you're running too fast, you're, you're crashing into that place too much, too often, and it's becoming a fixation and impeding other parts of your life, meditate, uh, uh, figure out the causes of this suffering and try to loosen them. Because 
the only way that the suffering becomes diminished is if we loosen the judgment and we loosen the notion of the self because that's the cause and the place of all of our suffering how can shama, sh uh, shamata be achieved in daily life? I mean, the first thing is to, you know, to really make meditation practice a ha you know, something habitual, right? Something you're doing very regularly and very consistently. I mean, on the on the cushion, you know, as a regular practice, and also realizing um, the benefit of, it, of the practice. You know, when when you start, and th that starts to bring you confidence. When you when you feel, you know, when you can have that experience of calm of your mind, kind of, you know, like that that image of the sediment rising to, uh, falling to the bottom, and the clarity being arising. You know, when you when you gain confidence in that experience, that that's what's happening. Um, that starts to become very important to you. It's hard for me to dis to talk about it without. Uh, it's hard for me to talk about it isolated from Buddhism and the pra and the and the, the Dharma, you know, and having confidence in that and in my teacher and in the teachings. Um, when those things become more and more important, uh, you start to see how they're important in daily life, and you start to see opportunities for practice in daily life. So my encouragement would be to, you know, remain very consistent. And if there's benefit that you're experiencing, then use that as, you know, confidence in deepening your practice. And, you know, I mean, if it's things that we're suggesting or it's other things that you're inspired by. And I think, you know, the experience and the opportunities for this um, will arise in daily life? Uh, it's a really, really good question. And I just want to stress one more time that shamatha vipassana are an experience. It's a physical experience. We find ourselves in it, doing it. It's an experience of resting and observing. It's not an experience of grasping, pursuing, and running, the usual stuff we do but it's an experience of resting and observing, allowing the luminosity of our mind to take first place as opposed to be clouded by conceptual arisings, the appearances. And so the more time you spend in that, the more you will recall it in every and all situations. Your mind is not gonna be the horse rushing out of the gate. Your mind will connect to that experience of rest and you will look at whatever is happening right here with a more expansive view with a bigger horizon in the back of it and you will be able to act out of that connecting it's very important because it is a physical connecting to a place to our within our being it is a a state of being that we experience and we can recall it the more we do it it's just like practicing anything else if you're a fireman as a in, in your profession and you go to someone's house and the fire breaks out in that house you know what to do instinctually the same thing using shamatha using practice in post meditation it means being aware of that ground aware of that place aware of that sensation and not have the second mind just rush in and take us away from that seat. Thanks for this important conversation. It seems we must look at our present thinking as well as the source of thinking, past and consequence of judgment, future. I struggle with this, simultaneously juggling of past, present, future, particularly in prejudging situations. I go into a default frame of mind. It's difficult to clear my mind of the past so I can look at the present. Um, yeah, it is difficult. It's difficult for everyone. That's why, again, that's why we're doing this. Um, you know, it's it's hard to answer this or address the question without knowing your, you know, experience or what, you, what you've been doing, what you are doing, if you're a beginner, if you've been doing this for a long time, you know. Um,
looking, the last thing you say, looking at the present with fresh eyes, basically is what we're working with and working on, you know, through this practice and these practices and, and the teachings as well. It's, um, our default has always been the, you know, past, which is regret, right? Guilt. Um, future is hopes and fears. Uh, and none of those things are reality, right? They're all even, if we're looking back at the past with guilt and remorse and things, it's our own projection on how it should have went, what we should have done, what we did wrong, or, you know, rehashing and relishing experiences we had and wanted to have that same experience now and and the future it's you know it could be fears of the future anxieties of what's coming up or you know desires for certain certain outcome hopes and things like that so something like shamatha is about sitting in the present you know letting mind settle into the present uh, and having that experience, um, yeah, I think we all, you know we all go into that default frame of mind because that's what we're used to. And like we said last week, the word in Tibetan for meditation, which is gom, which means uh, to habituate, to become familiar with, to familiarize, and that we have to repeat over and over and over and over again. So that. So somehow maybe that starts to become our default. Uh, I think that we run into the future because we project our desires. And we go into the past because we want justification for our aggression right now. When we look to the past, sometimes we recall beautiful things, but most of the time I think we recall negative things. And if I'm saying to myself right now, in this instance, I'm sitting here and I'm saying to myself, that guy didn't give me a piece of watermelon 20 years ago when I was in the kindergarten with him. That is a shield, a cover for me to put forward aggressive emotions right now. Uh, either way, going into the past or going into the future, we are escaping and avoiding seeing our mind right now as it is, because that's where life is happening. That's where experience is generated from. We have to be aware of the of our state of mind right now as it is. So if we're going into the past, let's ask ourselves, why are we recalling that my mother didn't sew a button on my jacket a hundred years ago? Was she so unattentive to me? Do I really need to regurgitate this judgment? Because what does it serve me right now? Do I just want to be an aggressive person who wishes to put a judgment on someone who is apparently less than me right now? Why am I projecting into the future? Uh, all of these things, whenever we escape backwards or forwards, there is no backwards or forwards, there's just memory and projection. We are using those mechanisms in order not to stay with the present. Why is the present so difficult is because we need to have mindfulness and we need to have honesty. And honesty is very difficult. But honesty is like, and mindfulness is like undergoing a course for an illness. And we have to make a choice whether we just, you know, ignore the illness or we are actually going to take the medicine, which is what the Dharma is. And we're going to look to beings, teachers like Garchan Rinpoche, the Buddha, Shakyam, Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddhas who are always around us, who are the doctors. I mean, are we going to live in that way or are we going to keep escaping? And so that's always the question. And we should always examine the reasons why we're escaping into what we're escaping to. Um, and we should only do that analysis really to understand the now, because there is only now. There is everything else is a projection. It's not. It's a way of not being present fully to oneself. Okay, um, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions today, unfortunately. But um, maybe you can write the questions into Michael Imperioli Meditation One Hundred One at Gmail, if you really want uh, that answered, or or come next week. Um, 
So let's dedicate the merit from today's practice for the benefit of all beings. By this merit, may all beings attain the omniscient state of enlightenment and conquer the enemies of faults and delusions. May they be, be liberated from this ocean of samsara and its pounding waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Okay. See you next time. Thank, Thank you, you. Nick.